Hello everybody, and welcome to this webinar on EV plus rooftop PV, the perfect match. Uh, why we think that EV and PV is the perfect match, you are going to find that out in the coming hour. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself. I am Franny Flinterman. Um, I'm project manager at Solar Plaza and in charge of this webinar series we are broadcasting this December on EV plus PV. Uh, last week, we started the webinar series with um, a first webinar. Uh, the recordings are available online and you can download them through our website. So please do so if you missed it or if you are interested in it. Uh, today, we will dive deep into uh, rooftop PV plus EV. And next week, we will discuss the business case for carport PVs plus EV. Um, well, let me first start with introducing Solar Plaza a little bit more. Um, maybe you don't know us, so let me quickly introduce us. We are a global uh, events organizer. Uh, we are established in uh, uh, 2004. We are based in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and we have hosted numerous events on uh, solar energy throughout the world. Uh, we have almost hosted 200 events uh, until now. Uh, we have a network of over 60,000 PV professionals uh, joining us at those events. Um, besides this, we also offer consultancy services, uh, for example, market and business intelligence and partner search and match matchmaking. Um, we also have a Solar Plaza Foundation. Uh, where we support several sustainable projects throughout the world. So if you are interested in knowing a little bit more about these, uh, these services and um, companies, then please visit our website or just reach out to us. Before we get started, I have a few practical notes, notes to share with you. Uh, first of all, feel free to ask all your questions to our speakers. You can use the question box, which you can see uh, on your screen uh, in the menu. And you can also use this question box for any technical issues that you might encounter during the webinar. Our staff is here to support you with that. And of course, the presentation slides and full recordings will be available in a few days from now. So we wanna make this uh, webinar as interactive as we can. Um, so please uh, share all your questions and we, we will do our best to answer them. But we would also like to ask you some questions. So we would like to start with the first poll. Um, this is the question. We would like to know a little bit more about your background. So could you please tell me, are you active in the PV business or active in the EV and charging business or maybe are you a company uh, or an organization who is just interested in PV plus EV or maybe uh, something else? So we'll give you a minute to answer this. So here are the results. So almost 50% active in the PV business. And uh, then second is uh, yeah, companies or organizations interested in PV plus EV, and also a fair bit on uh, yeah, active in the EV uh, business. Well, that's great to know. Thank you all for joining us. Um, let's move to the agenda of today. We have two presentations coming up. First, Ninka Onnen. Uh, she will um, present the potential of a rooftop PV plus EV. Uh, especially for electrifying uh, logistics in the Netherlands. And then we have a presentation of IWell and Sunrock. Uh, they will tell us a bit more on the business case of uh, EV plus rooftop PV. So let's move to the first presenter of the day, Nienke Onnen. Uh, she is project leader, sustainable mobility at Nature and Milieu. That's an environmental organization, a well-known environmental organization in the Netherlands. So welcome, Nienke. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. Um, yeah, let's get started. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Well, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about sustainable distribution centers because they are a good starting point for electrifying logistics. Um, well, I am Nienke and I'm working at Natura Milieu. Natura Milieu is an independent environmental organization uh, and we work towards a sustainable, um, uh, sustainable living mood for everybody. Uh, we do this. Um, oh, sorry, my screen is a bit blurry. Oh, um, so, um, oh, sorry. Uh, we focus on uh, both a climate climate neutral society in 2050 and restoration of biodiversity. Oh, yeah, sorry, the, the buttons are a bit uh, uh, strange. Uh, how we do this? We work on four different teams. We focus on uh, mobility, but also on the energy transition, food and the circular economy. And we do this in a 360 degree strategy. So we focus on policy makers to influence regulations. Uh, we work together uh, with companies uh, to stimulate uh, innovation and uh, research. And we um, uh, organize campaigns to inspire people to make a first step. So why focus on zero emission transport? Uh, as you might know, mobility causes around 20% of all CO2 emissions. Uh, and most European cities uh, currently do not comply with no new World Health Organization guidelines for air pollution. And as a result, more and more European countries and cities are implementing policies for zero emission transport. As an organization or a business, it's also to determine why you want to make a change. And this can be purely for environmental reasons, uh, but maybe you also uh, want to consider financial aspects, a competitive advantage, or, or um, you want to adjust to new rules and regulations. So why are we as an environmental organization interested in sustainable distribution centers? This is because we see a high potential in the next coming of uh, next, next couple of years. Uh, from 2025 onwards, 30 to 40 uh, cities will introduce zero emission zones for city logistics. And charging all those vehicles uh, might pose a challenge. Um, research indicates that around 70% of charging um, will be at distribution centers or business areas. On the other uh, side, we also see that uh, rooftop uh, tops from businesses are an untapped potential uh, for power generation. So in the next couple of years, the combination of EV and PV is, uh, is highly potential. So what is this potential exactly? Um, in the Netherlands, we have around 2,500 uh, logistical buildings. And these are the, the really big buildings I'm talking about. So the distribution centers. Um, um, research shows that um, if we look to these uh, rooftops, about five terawatt hour um, can be generated per year. And we calculated this is enough to supply half of the yearly uh, energy demand, uh, if we would uh, electrify all tr truck kilometers uh, currently driven in the Netherlands. So this is quite a lot already. Uh, and if we then also would add uh, additional uh, uh, buildings, um, so for example, smaller warehouses, uh, then the potential would even be higher. So what is then the added value of the combination of EV and PV? Well, from a societal perspective, uh, this contributes to public support for the energy transition. Uh, we know that local inhabitants prefer uh, solar uh, 
panel, uh, solar energy generation uh, on roofs, rooftops over the use of land. Uh, this is mainly for um, um, the reason that, of course, the view is nicer, uh, but also because people don't like uh, the impact on nature and biodiversity uh, when we put solar panels in fields. Uh, secondly, um, uh, the combination of EV and PV um, uh, will mitigate grid congestion problems. And this is mainly at system level because uh, charging infrastructure has less impact on the grid load uh, when part of the energy needed uh, is realized with pro private power generation. Uh, and more at an individual level, uh, a PV system can supply uh, energy to a battery, um, uh, which you can uh, which can store energy and which you can use later. And this can save costs and makes it also possible uh, to use smaller grid connection. So, what is the uh, added value for businesses? Um, for an entrepreneur, it's interesting to use the EV and PV combination because you can then uh, offer a truly green transport product, product to your customer. Um, what is also interesting is the lower cost price for uh, electricity and especially price certainty. And um, certainly in the current market, I think this is a really interesting point to point out. Uh, finally, there are also possibilities for uh, additional revenues, for example, from renewable energy units or trading uh, energy at flex market. Uh, and in this way, uh, using the combination of um, EV and PV, uh, we can ensure that the, the business case for electric transport or the TCO becomes positive quite soon. So for the first uh, types of logistics, this will be probably next year. Um, and in a few minutes, I will explain a little bit more about uh, these uh, renewable energy units. Um, then if you're a property owner, of course, uh, offering uh, the combination of EV and PV uh, ensures your property uh, is future proof and increases the value of your property. You can also um, offer new services and projects, uh, products such as charging infrastructure as a service. So I just mentioned renewable energy units uh, and probably these are not known for everybody. So I'll explain a little bit about this. Um, based on EU regulations, fossil fuel suppliers have an obligation to deliver a mandatory share of renewable energy to the transport sector. And in the Netherlands, uh, this is governed by a trading system, by the Dutch government. Um, and as a company, um, um, if you supply electricity your, your, to your vehicles, uh, you can voluntarily uh, register these deliveries um, at the Dutch Emission Authority. And in this way, you can uh, create renewable energy units which you can sell to companies which have an obligation. Uh, and the revenues can be really interesting, about uh, 12 to 49 euros per charge truck. So that's between uh, 14 and 23 cents uh, for each kilowatt hour. Uh, and um, uh, there's a, a range because uh, if you use uh, solar, uh, energy uh, directly in your vehicles, um, the amount of uh, renewable energy units you create is higher than if you use grid electricity. So really interesting from a business case perspective to look at. So um, I just uh, talked a little bit about the benefits of the combination of EV and PV. But in reality, we see that some businesses also face some obstacles in the realization process. Uh, from this perspective, it's interesting to know that uh, from 20, 2025 onwards, uh, the government is looking into a new obligation that will ensure that uh, all new utility buildings with a rooftop larger than 250 square meters uh, 
are obliged to use the, their entire rooftop to generate renewable en uh, energy. Uh, but maybe you're not looking for a new building. So uh, what can be other problems you're face, you, uh, you face? Um, the first aspect uh, can be a limited load bearing capacity. Uh, luckily, we know from research that a lot of the distribution centers don't have these problems. So third, two thirds of the uh, distribution centers do not have this problem. Um, another 9% only faces light restrictions, uh, and these can be solved quite easily. And there are financially viable solutions uh, around 10 euro a square meter that you can use. And then um, um, the, the, the load bearing capacity of your uh, rooftop is improved and you can uh, install PV uh, on your rooftop. And the government is currently also looking into a subsidy to help you with that. Um, then of course, uh, it, it's possible that you don't own your own um, building, but that you are a tenant. Uh, in these uh, circumstances, there can be a, a split incentive. So that means that your um, uh, property owner maybe is not willing to install um, uh, solar panels on the rooftops. Uh, in these cases, you can uh, look into green lease contracts, which can help you to divide uh, both cost and benefits uh, evenly between you as a tenant and the property owner. It might also be interesting to know that local governments acquire next year uh, new possibilities to also ensure uh, that existing uh, buildings um, uh, will generate uh, renewable energy uh, on their own rooftops. Um, so uh, another problem you might face is grid congestion. Of course, it's really uh, important that uh, if possible, you are ahead of this problem. So make a timely request to your grid operator if you are currently planning to either install solar panels or you're looking into uh, elect uh, electric uh, vehicles. Uh, ensure that they are aware of your plans and they can help you calculate um, uh, whether you have uh, might have problems with your current connection or that, uh, that is uh, sufficient. Um, but if you're faced with grid congestion, there are also uh, mitigation me measures. Um, I've uh, put uh, on uh, a little list of um, uh, mitigation, oh, mitigation measures uh, that are possible. So you can use smart charging uh, and a uh, charging strategy to uh, lower uh, the demand on your connection and divide it more evenly or smoothen it during the day. Uh, then, of course, you can also use battery storage, and then the battery uh, is charged at the moment that you consume less, and um, you have more power available uh, at uh, the moment your uh, grid connection uh, is not sufficient. Um, then a third option is to look uh, into a collective charging uh, solution. So this means you will need to cooperate with businesses um, uh, um, or other local businesses and then collectively invest in a charging uh, solution. Um, a fourth option are energy hubs. Uh, energy hubs uh, exist in, uh, in two different uh, forums. Uh, this can either be in a, in a physical way. So uh, you have uh, a private network behind one connection, so a closed distribution system, or a virtual virtual energy hub um, through the grid operators network. And the second option is still under development and it needs a new uh, kind of regulations. Um, then of course that you can also use a temporary generating generator. Um, preferably uh, running on renewable fuels, uh, and this can be uh, used as a temporary solution until the grid uh, connection uh, is established or upgraded. Uh, the main disadvantage is, of course, that this causes high levels of emissions. 
in the future there might be uh, uh, another another types of uh, mitigations measures uh, measures such as a non guaranteed connection or cable pooling um then finally uh, of course um uh, the combination of ev and pv um uh, causes that that you need to make high investments um luckily there are different types of grants that uh, available that can help you with these investments um there are uh, grants for uh, uh, infrastructure so charging infrastructure uh, there are grants for investments in um, uh, vehicles uh, but also uh, grants available for renewable energy generation um, still um, this means a high upfront investments uh, but on the other side also lower operational costs so it's really um, the case of looking uh, into the of developing a, a really solid business case it's also interesting to look into new business models uh, for example charging infrastructure uh, you can uh, sometimes also lease or um, and there are um, companies that offer it as a as a service this might uh, lower the the investment amount needed um, maybe you think um, well it sounds quite complex um, I'm either an expert in, in logistics and I don't know much about energy management or uh, um, I, I don't know actually uh, something about um, uh, electric vehicles uh, yes the EV PV combination um, uh, uh, well there there you need to have a, a knowledge from both sides um, but there are experts that can help you with this um so get yourself well informed uh, and um there are also companies uh, who have already developed the business case uh, and there's uh, interesting information for example so on internet on the internet uh, so get yourself um, informed and maybe uh, talk to some companies who already um, uh, walk through the process uh, and they often are, are uh, really willing to help you so this was all uh, for today. Um, um, we made a, a little report on this topic. Um, these are the, the findings of our report and you can download it on uh, our website. Uh, and if, you're, uh, have, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Thank you, Ninka, for sharing your insights with us. Um, Yes, the report that uh, people can download and uh, where you uh, shared uh, the key uh, insights of, it mainly relates to, uh, to distribution centers, but does it also apply to other companies? Yes, um, the, the findings and uh, also the, the benefits and um, well, the, the insights on overcoming obstacles, they also apply to other types of, of uh companies and buildings um we looked into distribution centers because they are quite big and uh, the power generation potential is quite high but of course it, it also applies to, to smaller buildings yeah you already sh uh, shared that there is a huge potential for utility buildings for example uh, but is there also another specific type of company um that has a big potential for this EV plus PV combination? Um, I think every company that has a, uh, uh, an own fleet, so if you have uh, your own electric or, or vehicles and, and you want to electrify them in the, in the near future, it is always interesting to look into um, uh, the possibility of using solar uh, panels because it just uh, improves your business case for your vehicles and it probably makes makes transport even cheaper than than uh, especially currently now with the higher diesel prices yeah okay well we have one remark from one of the attendees uh, it deals with uh, the renewable energy uh, units so the hbes um, this attendee shares that the administrative impact of uh, hbes can be uh, 
uh, pretty high. Um, and uh, to make it financially attractive, you would need minimally uh, 75,000 kilowatt hours. Um, yeah, what, what is your opinion on that? If you yes, have this is, yeah. yeah, this is true. Uh, you need a certain amount of, of kilowatt hours to compensate for administrative uh, uh, tasks you have to perform. Uh, and, and sometimes even a little investments uh, in terms of metering. Uh, but um, if you calculate it to the number of vehicles you need to have, this is quite small. So this means like uh, one truck suffices. Uh, and I do this by heart, but I, I think something like uh, 10 vans. Um, so uh, you don't need a really big fleet. Um, uh, make it attractive and um, uh, from our perspective we are uh, um, discussing uh, with the NEA, the Dutch Emission Authority, uh, ways to even lower these administrative hurdles so we want to make it attractive for as much companies as possible. That's really good news so uh, great to hear. Uh, well thank you Ninka for now, uh, we will see you later on uh, during the Q&A again. Uh, but thank you so far. Um, yes, and then our next speakers, they are interested in getting your opinion on a certain uh, question. So I would like to start with the question uh, that they have for you. Uh, and this qu question is, what, in your opinion, is the long-term solution to powering trucks and long-distance logistics? Is this electric transport based on batteries? or electric transport based on hydrogen or maybe you have the opinion that uh, another technology technological solution is uh, the answer to this uh, to this question uh, so please feel free to uh, to choose either one or uh, maybe the other um, in the meantime let me introduce the people behind this question uh, Vivian Emsbroek is head of development at Sunberg and Jan Willem de Jong is founder and director uh, business development at IWEL. Welcome both, um, happy to have you here. And let's have a look at the result of the poll. So, uh, well, that's interesting. Uh, almost 70% thinks electric transport based on hydrogen and 23% uh, electric transport based on batteries. So maybe one of you would like to react on, uh, yeah, on this uh, outcome. Yeah, yeah, maybe uh, uh, a small response like uh, thanks for having uh, us. Um, I, I think I would like to challenge the, the outcome of the poll. Not that the, 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 the uh, I, I think it, it will be mainly electric and uh, there's, there's not because hydrogen is a bad solution. Uh, but only if you, if you just look at the amount of energy you need to fill up uh, a hydrogen truck versus uh, an, an electric truck, uh, it's like like 90% efficiency or 30% efficiency. So you waste like tremendously amounts of clean energy, which we still have not enough at the moment in the Netherlands, uh, seeing where we are right now. Uh, in our current energy mix and what we're heading to. So yeah, especially on the short term, if you would like uh, uh, like fully push hydrogen tr trucks, I think you would slow down the, the energy transition and, and, and maybe more important also, uh, I believe the business drivers are very strong. Like if you have to pay like three times as much for your energy or three times as much energy uh, for, for the same kilometers, yeah, what do you think an entrepreneur will choose? So I think the economics speak for itself. Okay, and we beyond do you uh, agree with uh, your colleague uh, Jan Willem? Well, uh, yes, yes, I obviously agree, but I think we are a little bit biased. Uh, I think it's very positive that 90% uh, response that it's either going to be electric uh, with, with batteries or hydrogen, and that there's only 10% saying other. I think that's that's the that's the most important uh, one and i think that the other one is that uh yeah in all honesty uh, i find it a little bit uh, surprising that so many people think that it is uh, a hydrogen but it, i think it also underlines that yeah we are at the beginning 
So there's a lot of uh, opinions currently, uh, and we will see how this will evolve. Uh, I think we are in the midst uh, of the energy uh, transition. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, cool. It's it's uh, sounding good. Thank you for this. Uh, I totally agree with you that it's already good that 90% uh, feel that uh, electric uh, mobility is uh, is the answer. So uh, great to see that. Um, well, if any of the attendees has a very strong opinion on this topic, please share it in the uh, Q&A uh, box and maybe we can have a little discussion later on this topic as well. Uh, for now, let's uh, get started with your presentation. And uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I will kick it off. So it's a joint uh, presentation uh, today. Um, see if I can go to the next slide. So she joined presentation to get, um, together with Jan Willem from IWO. Uh, just to introduce ourselves, my name is Vivian Amsbroek, Head of Development uh, for the Netherlands, working at Sunwork. Sunwork is a developer of large-scale uh, solar systems where we uh, have a big footprint, uh, uh, specifically in the logistic uh, uh, real estate. Um, as Sunrock, we aim to make a significant uh, contribution to the energy transition uh, and we believe that we can best do so by um, having partnerships in place uh, with our customers uh, such that we can uh, have long-term relationships and really make an impact uh, and also that we do that with our partners because we don't know uh, we well we basically know that we cannot do uh, that uh, all by ourselves so we need good, uh, trustworthy partners um, to make a full solution. And I think that uh, Iwall is one of those uh, examples. Yes. Um, yeah, my name is, uh, as mentioned, uh, Jan Willem. Jan Willem de Jong, uh, director and co-founder of Iwell. Uh, short introduction, Iwell is a battery tech company with uh, a focus on hardware and software. Uh, um, we have like uh, our batteries installed at more than uh, 200 buildings around uh, the Netherlands. So uh, we're quite rapidly scaling now at the moment. Um, yeah, and yeah, like why are we doing this? Uh, like personally, I, I really want to make, uh, uh, I really believe in making the world a better place by making business uh, of, 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 a, of, of a good goal, like uh, which in our case is uh, the missing sustainable battery energy infrastructure. And uh, um, so that's what it's all about, like building tech and the business case uh, uh, to make uh, investments in the right solutions feasible also financially. So, um, yeah, that's basically uh, my short introduction. Thanks, Jan Willem. Uh, and I think it also underlines the, uh, the title of this, uh, this presentation or the, this slide, Energy Infrastructure Upside Down. I think the, the era uh, uh, has stopped where we could uh, just very easily uh, plug in to the uh, to the energy grid and we we could just get the any electricity that we uh, required. I think that um, uh, 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 that situation is currently totally different, uh, and that probably everybody either at home or uh, at their business understands or, or is actually uh, uh, feeling the consequences of those. Uh, so we need to look at our energy infrastructure, energy infrastructure differently, uh, and this calls for techn technical solutions that we are providing. Yeah, like like basically, if you you look like the trends, uh, energy the energy world turned upside down uh, through the energy crisis uh, we have uh, we are currently faced with, but also congestion, of course. And, and 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 to make it uh, uh, a bit more bold, it, it will never become like it used to be. Uh, uh, things are radically have radically changed. Like um, uh, first of all, like cheap cheap gas will not be available, which is kind of painful because we do need gas for the the next few years if you want to uh, keep the lights on uh, all all the all year long. Um, but also if you see like how rapidly the energy consumption and the energy generation with solar but also with uh, uh, wind uh, on, on, on sea uh, is, 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 is growing, um, I think cheap baseload energy pricing, which was something that, were, uh, what, that was really popular in the, in the Netherlands and Germany, that's, that's one of the reasons why we have 
quite a lot of uh, heavy uh, energy intensive industries in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, we really have to rethink that industry uh, because cheap energy prices will not be come back. Of course, we have good infrastructure, we have good, relatively good policies internationally seen, uh, and we have a harbor, etc. And, and, and Germany next uh, in our backyard, backyard. But the cheap energy prices will make uh, the landscape radically different. And I think, of course, we also have grid congestion, which is kind of creates a lot of sense of urgency. But if you zoom out a bit more, that's a ripple in, in, in the real big change. And the real big change is that, that the cheap energy prices will not come back. And, and what to do about it? Uh, yeah, that's what basically uh, this, uh, we will, uh, would like to tell, tell, tell you a bit more about. Yes, thanks, Jan Willem. So <clears throat> I'd like to thank also Nienke for her presentation and basically also uh, giving the explanation why it's, uh, it's, it's good to look into uh, uh, PV and, uh, and EV. I think you did a very a good job in, in, uh, in stating that, uh, what, what the advantages uh, are. <clears throat> uh, but just to, 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 to give you some facts, I think that if we as Sunwork look at our own uh, uh, development pipeline, I think 70 to 80% of the projects um, uh, yeah, are basically facing a grid congestion. Uh, so, so whereas five years ago, or sorry, five years ago, uh, I'm with the company only three years. So three three years ago, uh, that would be 10%. It's now 80%. Just underlying, uh, um, yeah, what what the impact is of uh, uh, of this uh, this um, grid congestion. Well. Obviously, every downside has its uh, advantage. So there's also um, uh, there's also an opportunity there uh, where we can provide a, a solution to be able to still make uh, such um, uh, well such projects um, possible. Let me see. I think there's something missing on the slide. There we go. So I think what what uh, what I will and and ourselves are trying to overcome is that basically um, with uh, solar solar system you can produce a lot of energy on site but I think that everybody understands that uh, the nature of solar is that it only produces when there's sun so either during the day uh, and, and also in the summer it produces a lot more uh, during the day than in the winter times whereas uh, if you're then gonna add um, uh, electric vehicles charging infrastructure uh, that has its own dynamics um, so uh, and then basically you have the, the grid in between. So either, either the grid locally, where you try to connect the, uh, the solar production to the, uh, uh, to the trucks, and also still have the capacity that comes from the, um, uh, from the grid itself. So, Jan Willem. Yeah, yeah, like, like, like maybe. Like yeah, like like a, a small small addition to that, like like how how do you uh, let's say you wanna start electrifying your uh, your fleet with cars, with trucks, uh, or both? Um, um, it, it, it that there are a lot of things you need to cover. Uh, first, uh, it used to be like I just buy trucks. I know what the diesel will roughly cost. I know what the truck will roughly cost. I know what the OPEX operating expenses uh, will, will roughly be. And that was basically it. Uh, you had to know what you pay and what the return on investment was. Now you have to buy trucks, which most of the times are, or not most of the times, all of the times are more expensive than diesel trucks, for now at least. Uh, but then all of a sudden you 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 are faced with uh, okay you need also charging infrastructure. If you need charging infrastructure, you also need to look into your energy infrastructure. Uh, the energy infrastructure uh, is required to let all your energy uh, kilowatt hours flow through your grid. Like all that things need to be combined just for that single truck if you go electric. So what we do is uh, on the one hand we have. Uh, um, uh, a battery and why is that important it's it, it helps on the one hand if in congested situations to provide enough power when you need it and on the other hand it also helps to provide power when the sun isn't shining uh, and basically when it's uh, it is available and the trucks are on the road during the day uh, you can store it but the battery only is not enough on top of that you need all kind of software services uh, to orchestrate all those uh, energy flows and you need 
uh, for example, PV optimizers to, 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 to integrate your solar energy, you need uh, uh, dynamic control of your, uh, your EV charges, you need uh, peak shavers uh, to, to, to make sure your grid won't be overloaded. And that's basically what the local energy management is covering. Like, uh, uh, it, 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 it tries to optimize all the time, like, uh, what should we decide uh, to make the most cost efficient uh, choice for our customer, uh, given the constraints of uh, grid capacity, uh, truck, trucking schemes and, uh, and energy prices. So uh, every every 15 minutes we try to to make the best guess like what 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 will be uh, uh, in in best favor of the of the client, and that's what all these software services and local energy management is about. Thanks, Willem. I will go to the next slide. <clears throat> I think that um, uh, uh, apart from the technical solution and the energy management system. <clears throat> It's quite a journey to come to such, an, uh, uh, such a solution because there's uh, uh, different uh, assets or technologies uh, involved, uh, but there's also different stakeholders involved. So some, some uh, uh, companies might own the building themselves uh, and have, uh, for instance, also the charging infrastructure, the electric trucks, everything. But there's, uh, uh, I think it's uh, uh, more generic that they would probably rent the building from, uh, from, uh, from a building owner. Uh, maybe also lease the charging infrastructure uh, and also lease uh, uh, the electrical trucks. Um, so basically what we try to do uh, is that we, uh, we follow our process to come to, come to an optimal solution, of course, where we first have a technical, technical analysis on the user consumption and the grid situation, because it basically determines the boundaries in which you can, uh, in, in which you can work. Uh, based on that, uh, together with uh, uh, together with Iowa, we designed the uh, the technical solution, which can be a combination, obviously, of solar, uh, battery, and, uh, and charging infrastructure, uh, but perhaps also a connection to the um, uh, building electrical insulation. Uh, so some buildings are heated with electrical uh, electrical heat pumps, or there might be um, uh, uh, cold storage there. So there might be also systems that provide uh, flexibility that you can use or uh, that also uh, poses a boundary that you need to be aware of. Uh, next step will be the financial engineering, uh, looking at the capex and the opex, of course, of the system, but also the benefits that can be created. Um, I think that uh, the, um, uh, the HBEs have been, uh, have been uh, mentioned already. We'll go into detail or Jan Willem will tell something more about it later on. Uh, but financial engineering is obviously very important and it also depends on the customer they uh, look at it whether they want to uh, invest themselves or want to have uh, 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 another company offering it uh, or us offering it as a service. Then the stakeholder alignment, I was just mentioning that there's different stakeholders, uh, but apart from the tenant, the building owner, there's also the building insurer, there's the inventory insurer, there's the grid operator. Uh, so there's numerous stakeholders that, that need to be taken into consideration uh, and, uh, and need to be aligned. Um, and then you can actually come to uh, the building and the integrated uh, solution, which after that also needs to be uh, need to be operated. <clears throat> so I think that the uh, uh, orchestration of this um, is a, something that we do during this whole process. Uh, and by doing this with two two <clears throat> two companies uh, as we are, uh, you are basically limiting the uh, the interfaces uh, that are in between. I think central to this is the uh, is the is the smart energy system uh, that monitors uh, the different assets. Um, so as Jan Willem was explaining, basically each uh, 50 minutes, uh, the whole system needs to decide what is the best best option to do, and that's obviously the best option for the user of the building. Whereas the PV system is a separate asset, you have the battery uh, uh, energy system, and you also have the charging uh, uh, infrastructure and, and, and therefore the um, electrical trucks. Uh, I mean, uh, as an example, it, it would be very easy to, to make sure that all the trucks are, are charged during the day. But actually, it might not be in favor of the, uh, of the program or the, the schedule that you have as a logistic uh, provider. And so sometimes the technical solution, what would, what would be in favor for the technical, 
technical solution might not be in favor of the uh, logistic pro process. Um, and also vice versa with regards to the uh, uh, to the financial solution that you're that you're making. So having a having a, a uh, energy management system that takes into consideration all these uh, boundaries and make these decisions, uh, yeah, is very important. And as I said before, there's also a link that can be made with other systems in the in the building that provide flexibility and therefore enhance the uh, the productivity of the uh, of the system. You have anything to add to this, Jan Willem? Uh, no, no, no. I think I think like like uh, maybe one one addition to make like is that uh, if if you look to what 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 are we optimizing? Like first and foremost, you are optimizing like local uh, constraints, uh, peak shaving, solar consumption, uh, charging uh, the trucks, and that's all based on local parameters. But simultaneously, we're also receiving uh, uh, real-time data on what are the energy markets doing and they're all during every 24 hours uh, there are always moments when the, the system is not required to do its local trick let's say, to, to, to say it like that and, 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 and during that moment we, we optimize uh, the, the, the business case for energy usage uh, for, for energy trading uh, outside uh, the building and, uh, and, and this, this optimization, uh, this smart system is really about value stacking those different revenue streams in a real time manner, uh, optimized uh, every 15 minutes based on what's happening in reality. Thanks. Thanks, um, Yeah, maybe for talking now about, it's talking about value stacking. Yes. Oh, it's a nice bridge. Thanks, Weaver. Um, now, uh, talking about the business case, of course. Um, uh, first, like like uh, high over, uh, like what are the components that that actually create the 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 the, the savings uh, in 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 a case? Um, on the one hand. Uh, and this this increased quite dramatically uh, uh, since uh, the energy crisis is safe on energy cost by using more solar energy locally. That's roughly like 35% of the business case. Uh, it 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 might vary per 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 situation, but roughly that's about 35% of the revenue. And another one very important: the HBEs and the certificates uh, you can receive, uh, which uh, was already explained by Nienke. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an additional uh, revenue you can receive from uh, the Dutch, uh, Dutch government entity uh, by proving that you actually used local solar uh, to charge your trucks. And that's something we can fully uh, organize uh, for you. And we, we take over all the, 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 the administrative hassle and uh, we just we just uh, help you out there and uh, take care of that. And that's a quite important one. It's like a roughly like 40% of the business case depends on it. So it's a really good governmental incentive to locally produce and locally use that uh, energy. And that, yeah, as I said before, like, like 17 to 24 cents it can 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 be uh, can be added uh, using this at, at hbe's uh, per kilowatt hour so it's quite a dramatic uh, increase uh, and of course the final one is the 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 revenues to, uh, created by energy trading when uh, locally the the system isn't uh, is it required? And 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 like combining those three together is basically the, the, the those are the big ingredients uh, that uh, uh, make a, make make a good business case. Of course, there's a, a lot more detail in the mix, but that's uh, like uh, maybe go to the next slide and to 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 to, to share some real world uh, uh, examples on this. Uh, for example, this uh, it's still on the NDA, so I cannot share the name, but it's a real world situation uh, of uh, a large transportation uh, company. Uh, they have like uh, over 150 uh, diesel trucks, and he bought his first uh, eight uh, electric uh, trucks, uh, like long haul uh, trucks, like uh, over 500 kilowatt hours, so one of the first. Um, they also have like 1.7 gigawatt hour solar production. Uh, uh, on the yearly basis, but they also have a quite a big problem. Uh, that it's a grid congested area, and they only receive 65 kilowatt uh, consumption uh, from the DSO. 
Uh, at the same time, they are allowed to feed in uh, up to 1,700 kilowatts. Uh, and, and, and they need uh, to, to make this work, they needed a, a battery of one megawatt and 2.15 megawatt hours. Of course, you can make it bigger or smaller, but this is more or less where the optimum is for in, in, in this case. And uh, that's something also we can work. Like on the one hand, like quite a challenging situation. Only those eight trucks, uh, will use more than uh, one gigawatt hour on a yearly basis energy consumption. If you would 365 days, 24 seven, uh, uh, pull 65 kilowatts from the grid, you will get like 0.5 gigawatt hour, the most. The most. So it's, it's kind of challenging to make this work. Uh, but that's why you really need the, the, the solar energy. And by doing that, you can, in the new situation, you can reduce your uh, the, the feed-in from uh, grid energy, uh, or the, actually the consumption from grid energy uh, by 81%. Of course, you have some re reduced incomes by uh, lower feed-in tariffs, but still, this 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 will 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 make you about 50k uh, on a yearly basis. Then the HBEs again, like also uh, as you can see, uh, uh, quite a big chunk on the on, on this part and the subsidies. And, and what you see in this like very challenging situation, you can still uh, make a, like earn a complete system back in six six to seven years. And if congestion will be alleviated within let's say two, three, four, five years, the 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 the, the return on investment will become even uh, even better. So congestion and high energy prices uh, shouldn't be a showstopper if you want to uh, really take this serious economically. <laughs> so that's it for now. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, really interesting information that you shared. So thanks a lot for your openness and for sharing this with us. We got quite a few questions from the audience. So I would like directly start uh, to directly start with it. Uh, one relates to the cost side of the business case. Uh, for example, there's a question about what is the cost of storage uh, euros per kilowatt hour we are speaking of to make local energy management solution attractive. Yeah, if you you it was in one of my in my last slide, like a rough indication of. Of course, I cannot give like the exact prices here. Uh, uh, that that's a case by case. But uh, somewhere around uh, uh, 800 to 950k for uh, two megawatt hours to put it. That, that's roughly where you the, the, the ballpark. Um, and of course, depending on the size of the battery, this can uh, can vary a bit uh, because uh, higher quantities will lower the price, of course. But this is a rough in the in indication. Okay, and great. Of course, you also have OPEX costs uh, for the so software services, but the, the, the payback period, uh, I, I took those all in, into, into account. Yeah. Uh, we beyond any additions from your side, maybe on the cost side of the investment uh, for such projects? Well, we, as I try to explain it, we basically say that using a battery to store and release energy, it costs around, let's say, 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and that's then excluding the cost price of the energy itself. So, and, and it might differ uh, depending on uh, economy of scale. <clears throat> but it's uh, yeah, for, quite often you hear, oh, let's let's put a battery there. Uh, uh, it's interesting, um, but it's definitely not always interesting. Uh, so there is a cost involved. Uh, so if you uh, use the battery wisely, and as as Jan Willem has explained, indeed start stacking the advantages it can be profitable and it can be a good solution. But just as an indication, uh, I'd say, well, let's say it costs around 15 cents per, per megawatt hour. And if you're, if you don't, if you're not hesitant, then, then let's, uh, let's talk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for sharing this. Uh, Nienke, there was still a question on your presentation. Uh, the question was how easy or complex is it to get a license to operate an energy hub with a closed distribution network. Do you have any information on that? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not a personally not an expert on that, but uh, what I uh, understand, uh, what I do understand is that uh, such a closed system is quite complicated uh, to realize. 
So uh, that's that's not something you can do as a company yourself. You really need to contact an expert on that to help you with that. Yeah, I think I can add to that. Uh, we're we're connected to uh, to a closed uh, energy uh, system there, and it's definitely not something that you would undertake as 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 one single company. Um, but I think that there's much more value in creating an energy hub, uh, basically a virtual energy hub especially with the non-firm auto that is coming in, uh, that, that should be coming in um, within the next year, uh, that's becoming far more interesting. Yeah, okay. and, and maybe in addition to that, like um, also see like what's your starting point? Like if you can make a really good proper investment and, and, and really take back control of your energy costs and uh, uh, by investing in this hardware and make sure that that uh, installation you 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 will install there is able to be integrated within such an energy hub that that can also uh, prevent a chicken and egg discussion like where to start together or alone or like it, it doesn't have to be uh, either of those okay great uh, then a few questions that are a bit broader uh, for example this one uh, what about rooftop PV on gas stations to combine with fast EV charging uh, infrastructure. Are there any positive use cases for that? And is a battery a must have? Um, the attendee assumes that relatively small rooftop areas on average uh, is often the, limit, uh, the limiting factor. Uh, so regarding the, yeah, the combination of rooftop PV on gas stations, maybe Nienke, this is a question for you to answer. Maybe this is something Natura Milio has also looked into? Uh, not specifically on, on gas sta stations, no. Uh, but I think well, putting solar is, is probably, in most cases, a non regrets uh, solution. It probably is not enough uh, to supply uh, uh, charging infrastructure uh, locally. But of course, uh, every little bit helps uh, also on a system level to, to prevent uh, further uh, grid, um, grid problems. So I should really uh, yeah, applaud the parties that, that are looking into that. Okay, and maybe a bit related question, or well, not entirely related, but still, um, would um, having solar panels on trailers um, be a logical next step uh, to you? So this relates to not having to generate solar on your rooftop, but having a vehicle, a truck or a van that generates the electricity itself. Yeah, I think there's some pilots uh, doing that currently already. Uh, I think one of the best examples is Lightyear that probably everybody has heard in the, in the, in the news. But to go back to trailers, what you see is that, for instance, uh, a lot of trailers are uh, conditioned, uh, so they're, they're, they're freezing options. And uh, and these, while these are standing parked next to the to the uh, to the highway, they still need to condition their goods in the back. And there's that these are very small uh, diesel generators that are then uh, running. And these are actually more polluting than, than the engines themselves. Uh, and if you can exchange this for solar panels, it's a perfect, it's a perfect solution. So definitely, yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah. really agree with Weba. I think this is the best uh, practical implication uh, uh, way to, to apply it. Yeah, agreed. Like not for driving, like that's too ambitious. But for this, like it could really uh, make a big positive uh, improvement. Okay. Well, we are almost at the end of the webinar. It's almost three o'clock, but I would like to end the webinar with the last poll. Um, yeah, I would like to know now after having had heard uh, or listened to this webinar uh, for the past hour. Um, I would like to have your opinion on what is the main challenge of EV and PV de development, in your opinion. Uh, are those the vehicles themselves, uh, the grid challenges regarding the growing demand for EV charging, uh, integration of EV plus PV and storage, maybe finance um, aspect or legislation? Um, so, yeah. Uh, a question to the speakers: What would be your guess that uh, the outcome of this um, of this poll is? What is the main hurdle, or what do you think that the, most people think is the the biggest hurdle? 
maybe Ninka or Vivian or uh, Jan Willem, yeah, could you I, do a guess? I, I would argue between the first and the second. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg, egg uh, situation. Uh, but myself personally, I would say that the uh, net congestion, the grid challenges, are the biggest uh, hurdle, uh, or or will be at least. Yeah. Yeah. Also, what you experience in in projects. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's have a look at the outcome. Well, that was a really good guess. <laughs> Uh, indeed, the grid challenges. So there's a lot to improve on that side, um, definitely. Uh, then uh, integration of EV plus PV plus storage. So yeah, room for uh, sharing your story more often, maybe. Uh, and uh, then the EV, uh, the legislation and the EV vehicles. Well, that's uh, good to know. Well, I would like to conclude this webinar uh, by thanking our speakers for their uh, for sharing their insights. Thank you, Jan Willem, Vivian, and Ninka. It was great to have you here, and thank you to all the attendees for joining us. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you back next week for our third webinar on EV plus carport PV. See you later. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you, Tony, as well. Bye bye. Bye bye.